five people here at Bankhead for the first of four climate change presentations put on by What in the World is Going On? Our speaker tonight, Paul Jensen, has a very, very impressive resume. He's a former director at DMI Industries in Fargo, which was involved in wind energy. He's also served a 25 year career with Atia Brown Borgery Corporation, a multinational Fortune 500 company based in Switzerland. Paul was stationed overseas for 18 years, managing country organizations and divisions in North America, Europe, the Middle East, as well as some African countries. He brings more than 45 years of energy experience gained from power generation, transmission, distribution segments of the utility industry. Paul's educational background stems from Denmark. You might know it's just a tiny, tiny little accent, not too much. Oh. He married an American gal, so she really, you know, turned him into a, a good, strong American man. While later, he also attended Duke University, the Cooper School of Business in North Carolina, and the University of California, Berkeley. Paul's current responsibilities are with Green Wave Energy as an owner, partner, and president. They work as an advisor for key owners and local government who are considering changing to less CO2 uh, in terms of uh, fueling vehicles and um, thinking about uh, electrical vehicles and propane auto gas. Paul continues to be a guest lecturer on a host of topics related to energy. He is an active member of CHEAM, which stands for Citizens Local Energy Action Network, based out of Fargo. Please join me now in welcoming Paul Jensen. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. And, uh, I think all my tools get started. For some reason, the controller is not wrong. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, um, yeah, welcome to uh, tonight's presentation here on, we're going to maybe talk about the HR 684, the bill we call the, uh, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Job Act from uh, November of last year. That's being introduced now. So where did I do this? Here we go. <laughs> All right. Let's see if it works. Can you move the mic up? Yeah. Okay. Move the yeah. mic up. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. But uh, I don't think I can just slide forward. There it goes. Anyway, so um, I'm here uh, representing Clean, the Citizen Local Energy Action Network, which uh, was introduced uh, just now. And uh, I'm here together with our chairman, Nancy Chala, who's sitting there in the audience. And uh, it was his idea to get this organization started. So uh, we want to promote an understanding of the global challenge facing humanity. And um, there's been, there's been decades of exponential growth in both population and consumption. We're now colliding with the limits of the Earth's biosphere, destabilizing the very foundation of intelligent life as we know it today. About our group, um, we are located and serve as part of Moorhead community to work for the continued sustainability emission reduction and efficiency improvement in the energy sector. And have been done to doing that since 2016. We also have devised a 30 year plan, originally uh, written by Dr. John Dagel, uh, for creating a pollution free zone, specifically related to the transportation, and um, to uh, reduce, the, reduce the amount of particulates emitted 
from the vehicle. We take our lead from the uh, government panel on climate change, on their uh, basis, their findings, and also on other organizations uh, like the Stockholm Resiliency Institute, Argon Laboratories, NASA, Planet Reality Project, and also from the Club of Rome. Or anybody has heard about the Club of Rome. But that was actually the organization that only started in 1972 on climate change issues. Anyway, CLEAN is also an affiliate of the Coda Resource Council. So some of you may know this chart. This talks about the nine planetary boundaries. And I would say we belong definitely in those orange areas there, the, the green, the yellow, and orange areas. And the uh, ones you see here at the bottom is the uh, phosphate and nitrogen uh, flows. And um, you also see uh, the number of species uh, threatened us for one year. That's the chart. That's the chart for the spread of species on this earth. And um, we, I have 17 sustainability goals that are derived from the research. And uh, the ones that I'm personally interested in is the, the uh, poverty, the uh, climate action, and affordable energy. The others are, of course, also very important, as you can see, but uh, those are the ones that I prioritize myself personally. And then here is out there, you see number 17, that's the conference of parties, the COP group that I invited every five years uh, to uh, convene the group of nations on this earth and to agree on what we're going to do about climate change and the effects that we have, what mitigation can we do, and what adaptation are we going to do. So, a little bit of my, myself, you already spoke a little bit about it, but I've lived in many countries. Uh, I've been a corporate citizen most of my life, and so my five, my wife and my children and myself, we moved from country to country for that country called ADB. Uh, that was headquartered in Zurich, Switzerland, and uh, uh, was active specifically also in the Middle East for quite a long time, almost 10 years in Saudi Arabia, and eight years in various African nations. Uh, but we moved to America in 2000, roughly. Uh, Kids had to go to college, and uh, there was a better option for us to go here than to go anywhere else. So that's uh, enough for me. So, the only song, let's get to it here. The climate crisis is the centerpiece of this discussion. And we'll also talk about actions needed and policy to deal with the crisis in a fair manner. Uh, mitigate negative externalities, create an unstable balance favoring one set of stakeholders over the welfare of the general public. And uh, define common plans and rules, leveling the playing field for shared resources, and uh, we can systematically and equitably advance low-income communities with positive economic and social and environmental outcomes. And the idea is that we also have to start jumpstart the clean energy solution to smart intensive, which requires policies. And I can tell you here, you know, some of you have probably heard about up temperature. Um, the, uh, the idea that the simplest explanation for a problem is probably the most likely one. Well, that does not apply to climate change, I'm afraid. It's not that we don't have a simple solution to this. There are so many other things we need to look at. But uh, it's all about the uh, free markets that need to play a role in a very critical role in advancing clean energy through informed decision making, uh, innovation, leveraging market incentives, and satisfying customers and making profits. And change is required, uh, and this results in a change in the balance of power with commensurate challenges and upheaval. Uh, we will get into some politics, maybe. Education and consensus building are needed to reach a critical solution to public needs while effectively advancing market solutions. So basic, basic to climate change is communication, reduce eliminate costs in the transportation sector, energy sector, industry, agriculture, 
and so on. And then we have to do adaptation for when things are flying wild, then we have to comply with what nature gives us. So that's disaster management, flood management, infrastructure, and technology advances in population displacement, displacement and migration, migration and management. I've personally witnessed quite a lot of that in my life, especially in the Middle East, where a lot of people have to flee because first of all, they have wars and disagreements, but secondly, the infrastructure there is so run down that uh, with the population growth, they're just not going to be able to survive. I fear the day in Saudi Arabia, for example, doesn't have any income from oil or significant, which is not so near, not so far from Egypt. And then you're going to have roughly 200 million people in total from that whole Middle East region wanting to migrate elsewhere, and the problem will be significant for the rest of the world. So the first part of it here is the mitigation, which is what we can do right now. But uh, when mitigation is, when we're trying to do things with mitigation, well, when that's not possible, then we do have to make some adaptation. And uh, the equity involved in that, the human equity, is of course significant. So who's going to pay for it? Who's going to suffering from all of this uh, adaptation? The little basics here on the climate change, you know, about the solar radiation that comes into the surface of the atmosphere and the stratosphere of the Earth. It shines down on us. And then uh, some of this radiation is stored in the Earth. I would say about 95% of all the heat sources are absorbed in the ocean. And the rest of it uh, uh, on land. And uh, some of the energy radiated back into space by Earth, uh, by, uh, by the Earth in form of infrared waves. And that's where the problem lays. Because we have that, uh, we have gases like methane and CO2 that goes into the atmosphere and they are heat trapping um, because they are actually trapping the infrared, the outgoing infrared radiation that should have gone into the universe is trapped under uh, the layer of the atmosphere. And here you see some of the things that are causing most of these emissions, you know, the coal plants, of which we have some here, and we have uh, a lot of industrial processes as well. Yeah, last summer we saw a lot of uh, forest burning in North America and Canada. So all of this emits the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. And that is, of course, holding the heat within the atmosphere, subsequently warming the Earth. And as you have seen in many reports, the, uh, the uh, polar caps are melting, and with that, the albedo effect, the effect of reflecting the whiteness of the ice into the universe again, is strung off, this would be quite dramatically. This chart here is interesting, but it's of course very tedious to look at, but uh, just wanted to put things in perspective. This is a chart that shows the balance of the uh, global warming about where the, the carbon cycle, where, where carbon is having an effect on the ocean and the products from the uh, forest and the agriculture farming and so on, the ones you saw on the other slide. So just to put things in perspective, this is measured in something called pentagram. One pentagram is a 1.1 billion metric ton. That's a lot. And to put this in perspective, you need to think coal trains. We have a lot of those in North Dakota. And one hopper car will hold about 100 tons of coal, which is about 80% carbon. If that hopper car, the hopper car is about 60 feet long, then a train hauling one pentagram, one, will be 156,500 miles long. Try to let that sink in. A train, 156,000. 500 miles long, that's just one different. And we're talking about um, four or five of them being admitted, uh, that, that is contained within the atmosphere. And as a matter of fact, uh, there are some other dramatic uh, uh, slides uh, that talks about the uh, effects of the global warming. It's equivalent to roughly exploding 600,000 Hiroshima bombs Every hour. That's how much heat energy that's been generated through the 
connection up to the radiation to go into the atmosphere or into the universe. So it's quite significant. The areas that are specifically significant are transportation, electricity generation, and industry. Of course, also commercial and residential buildings and agriculture. But these three first ones are the two that are those that are the most. And the result of all of that is what do we have here? We have the drop of carbon. And you see all of these things. Yeah. It is the number one threat to global economy. And that's the important part of it because we like to dabble with money, of course, and, uh, and when you see it on your wallet, then all of a sudden it makes sense. By the way, I want to let you know, I come from a little country called Denmark, and uh, it fits five times into the area of the coast. Five times. We are 780,000, 90,000 people here in this state, I believe. What do you think? How many people do you think would live in North Dakota if we had the same population density as them? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. 24 million. 24 million. Imagine 24 million in North Dakota. A try Taiwan. You can fit Taiwan five times in here. So that population, there will be 120 million people in the state of North Dakota on the same area. So there's no wonder why that we have little comprehension of the environmental impact here because we're not exactly densely populated. And I think that's important to understand that the world outside of North Dakota is a completely different animal. I can tell you that. Anyway, so. You all heard about the COP26 that was held in Glasgow this uh, last year in, in I think November, yeah. And uh, what they started out with was in 2021, they had a status, uh, the, the Paris Agreement, and the nation that signed on to this was pretty much everybody except the one in the Middle East area, some African countries like Libya. And, and of course, there's a natural reason for that. But basically, the rest of the world signed on. Uh, and we did in 2021 when uh, Joe Biden became president because we were out for four years. And then uh, afterwards, we signed us back in again because you know we have to lead the world. We don't have to stand on the sidelines and watch everybody else pass it by and get into it. So lose the opportunity. For clean energy products and environment, you know, electric solutions and so on. So, uh, and in that conference, I think on the first, the first takeaway was probably this here. You know, this little lady that has the name we cannot be mentioned. Well, it's Greta Thunberg, but anyway, she's a fellow Scandinavian. And yeah, she said most of what you guys are talking about is blah blah blah. Make some damn commitment. And it was very hard for the political leaders to understand because there's all this, all this diplomatic ping pong going on. And she's right. She's absolutely right. We have a responsibility to the future generation, those being the young people who sit here. We can't leave such a garbage pile behind. And we are. And why are we? That's a, a question we have to answer. Some political scientists will be able to tell us that. But anyway, governments have shamelessly congratulating themselves for insufficient precision uh, pledges to cut the emission. And by the way, um, on second sight, of course, we had some submissions done, and uh, they said we want to achieve 1.5 to be great, uh, right by 2050. But already this year, we are track because we're not taking the magnetic action to safeguard and prevent the, the um, climate for our future generations. They have to battle with it. They're inheriting this. And it's irresponsible of us not to do something about it. So we have to provide some aggressive plans to do so. And um, I would say the first was in the government for panel on climate change that sort of set the tone. And then in the Paris Agreement, everybody discussed it intensively. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of scientists at the government for panel on climate change that have studied all these. Uh, different things in great detail. 
and uh, I trust them. Uh, they don't have anything personal to gain from this other than uh, deliver a good, high quality scientific product. And that's what they do. So everybody voted at the Paris Agreement to participate. And, um, and we stepped out for a while, but then it became top 26 instead. So we looked we were going to comparison on how are we aligning up nowadays. And I put in the global issues on power generation, the decarbonization, community, and ecosystems, and whatever plans and programs we have, and uh, collaboration with communities, which is going to be important. It's going to be quite important that we actually reach out to organizations like Clean, ERC, uh, yourself, to understand uh, what can they do. We need to communicate and collaborate and make our political leaders understand that it's urgent and we need to do something now. As you can see, I don't have much here from North Dakota because there isn't much left, unfortunately. There will be, and I'll show you something about that. So this checklist was made for that purpose, but here comes the calorie, and it's basically the infrastructure investment and job tax. I bet we uh, will set aside quite a lot of money for the mitigation and in some cases also adaptation. So it begins at the very top, as I told you before, and then it, it, it sort of filters down to the government in the United States and they agreed upon a bill that could support the objectives on the uh, COP26 agreement. And then from there on, it's supposed to go down to the level of North Dakota. And uh, North Dakota State has to then communicate with various municipalities in our state to try and achieve these uh, goals and uh, to make the right investments in the right uh, area. And we need the volunteers, uh, municipal green groups, and experts and educators to step up once that the various departments are asking for input, because they will be asking for input from everybody here. Here is the lead on the bond. Here are the billions of dollars, right? And you see transportation sector, 284 billion, facilities, 46 billion. Time to then 73 billion. Environmental remediation 21. Drinking water 55. Western water storage 8.3 billion. And broadband 658 million. Sorry, billion. <laughs> big number. Very big number. And these are all areas that have significance for North Dakota. And you can, you can see them specifically in Texas. We say power and energy is very important. Resiliency is pretty important also. Environmental remediation, that's when you look at the cabin the gas wells that are leaking out of the river basin. That's the money trying the money that's going to allocate for brownfield remediation and all that. So all those uh, leaking wells out there that have to be kept and closed because methane, some of you may know. Is significantly more harmful to the atmosphere than CO2. Some claim by the fact of 80, but I mean, some say 20 times more. Um, but again, it depends on the time it takes for the methane to, to uh, uh, type into the universe. CO2 stays there 100 years, whereas the methane may be 10 years or so. I'm not an environmental scientist, and I'm not a meteorologist, but this is, of course, what I have heard. It's what I have heard and been reported to me. The other area of interest is the, the energy and environment. And you can see here there's a weather adaptation program, um, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation, uh, carbon dioxide transportation infrastructure, battery processing grants. Energy efficiency and conservation block grants. And there are many other ones in there. Sponsor remediation, hydroelectric grant program, and competitive grant program for energy infrastructure. And in the description, you can see what I wrote about the, the what, what, what has to happen there. I'm not going to go through each of these things just now, but you can see it. Uh, the one thing I'm going to focus on is the 
focus on today is maybe the one highlighted in yellow. But before that comes brains to start and fueling infrastructure for corridors and communities. And that's something that's quite important for us in North Dakota. Because we have the alternative fuel transportation corridors um, uh, lined up. But now they have to be populated with EV charging and other alternative fuels such as compressed natural gas or renewable natural gas, propane, hydrogen, etc. etc. And the first bill has 2.5 billion, and the second one has $5 billion. And then electric buses, vehicles, and infrastructure incentives, $7.5 billion. So that's, of course, aimed at bus uh, lives in the metropolitan areas, such as Marvel, Grand Falls, Bismarck, Minot, and Wilson. Uh, um, I don't know how many buses are there, really. but uh, I think uh, Fargo is the highest thing. And uh, then you have the um, clear clean school vehicle program. So, of course, uh, school buses. They need to be cleaner. We don't need to use buses either and outside killing the students uh, in their early years, in particular that they're breathing into their lungs. Um, those of you, I, there are a number of decisions here. <laughs> they probably see the result of, of uh, uh, lungs that have been infected with diesel emissions or diesel particulates. Um, we have a clean sports and fairies program, which does not really apply to us. And then we have a medium and heavy duty charge and the duty truck applied to us. Um, that's for the uh, trucks, et cetera. And then we have a new target target that costs about 500,000 targets must be put into the ground before year 2030. So by the 50s, I can't read it anymore, my eyes are screen, but 2030, I think it is. Okay. And um, there's the wildfire mitigation. We all know how important that is. So, for general uh, information, the state program is the secretary that are going to work with these Navy programs. They're going to provide the state with initial grants, the regular straightforward grants. Then there are so called formula grants, non competitive awards based on predetermined formula, and performance grants. That's how, that's how they're going to. Give you out the money. And uh, Secretary Granholm and Buddhism, they have both to share $7.5 billion. And they help the state with various instructions. They have issued booklets uh, to the state on how they're going to look at this fund, these funds, and what they're going to do with them, and what studies they have to do, and what input they have to get from the community. And then they have to come back with a response to to the to the uh, to their office, the joint office, uh, by first of August, the state plan has to be completed. So North Dakota has to complete its plans now. And they have put out an RFP. I'll show you that a little bit later here. But by the first of August the state plans are due and by the 30th of September the Federal Highway Authority for approve a state plan. So, 2022, we have a total of $1 billion available in the country. The joint office will take $300 million. It's an expensive office, I think. And 10% um, of this uh, EV formula funding for grants to state and local governments to require additional Assistance to strategically deploy EV charging infrastructure. <coughs> and the Federal Highway Authority's operation administration will get $15 million for doing that. And what's available is $615 million in 2022. And the important thing about this job tax bill is that it has to create family sustaining union jobs that cannot be outsourced. Because we want people to have an opportunity to benefit from this change. That's the equity part. Right? So the Navy, Navy formula program has specific funding requirements. So they say that any new charging infrastructure acquired or installed with a formula shall be located along designated 
designated alternative fuel corridors. And I-94 is one of those. I-29 is another one of those. I would say we need to uh, designate Highway 2 as well and some of the highways going north-south in order to create adequate uh, EV charging opportunities. Uh, the rules are that there should be no more than 50 miles between the charging stations. <laughs> No. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, the infrastructure must be allocated along these uh, located along these corridors, and uh, the states will use the alternative fuel corridor to consider nominating additional corridors, and that's what we want them to do at North Dakota Department of Transportation. And um, so what they did is that they have actually gone out for out for I'm going to show you that one later. So a fully built out corridor must fulfill the following for the secretary to set, certify the state's designated alternative fuel corridor. <coughs> so there has to be charging for every 50 miles, and there has to be charging within one mile from the corridor. And they have to have a total of 600 kilowatts available for each charging station, of which each of them must be able to deliver 150 kilowatts. So four plus 150 kilowatts each. That's the objective for this plan. And so I think this is exactly what people will have to quote. They have to quote four times, four plus 150 kilowatts each, and laid out in a way that makes it easy for people to park and then recharge their vehicle. So they have to, each state is required to develop a plan to submit their final plan not later than August the 1st. So I mean, they really got to get going right now uh, because uh, time's running and I haven't seen anybody yet working on it. And so I appeal to the states to put emphasis, uh, put, put uh, specific emphasis on getting this done now. Uh, they should work directly with the joint office of, of uh, the Secretary of the at uh, Run Home. And uh, they will provide the office, uh, they will provide the assistance needed for the state to create those plans as well. And the Federal Highway Authorities will uh, work with the Joint Office to review the plans. And then by September 30th, they will come out with a response of uh, where are these new uh, fueling stations, fueling charging stations going to be. And it all costs money, of course. And where where are they getting this money from, you may ask? Because they're not increasing their taxes, but they're taking away from programs that previously had money allocated to themselves or to them. And those are the ones that I have listed up here. So two hundred five million from the COVID relief fund. So I plan to then spend all that money on COVID. Yes. So uh, 50 million and so on from triangular paid a federal unemployment benefit, 50 billion dollars, How did that happen, right? And states returning uh, use uh, enhanced federal unemployment insurance supplement, sales of the wireless spectrum auction. So that's you know the horizon of this world of uh, AT and T and so on. They have to pay for the wireless spectrum for terms of 5G network. And so they have to uh, make an offer. So they estimate that they're going to get 20 some uh, billion out of that. And then um, I do not know exactly what that February 21 C band option is. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, but delaying Medicare Part D rebate rule, don't like that one. But <laughs> Of those. The economic growth is solving from a 33% return on investment in these long term infrastructure projects of 56 billion, and so on and so on. I won't them all. But you can see that's where they're going to get that money from. This is over and above what we would normally set aside for these programs. So it's uh, these 588.6 billion that's added to what we normally would have brought. Okay? And here we go, the two secretaries. I hope it works now. 
There we go. I haven't been video for you. Except for a minute. Long. Secretary Pete, I am with one of our great DOT electric vehicles and excited to go pick up a friend who's oh. going to share some news. How come this doesn't go this way here? Sam? Where's this on for some reason? It's on the screen. Is it on the screen? Yeah. Oh, there. So if you need to drag your screen over to the other window, you gotta do it. Can I do that? Click on that. Yeah, and then what? Secretary Pete, I am with no, one of our no, great no. DOT electric vehicles and excited to go okay. with a friend who's going to share some news on the future of well, electric vehicles. I guess we'll have to skip that then. There she is. Hey, how about that? Hopefully they let me drive this. It was a good movie. Mm -hmm. anyway, it's it's up. Up. There we go. Oh, it's fine. Okay, here we go. Yeah. There we go. This is exciting that we're going to be able to um, have joint, a joint office referring to our ability to help local electric vehicles. Makes sense, right? I mean, the, the future of life and that part of transportation is electric and separate transportation. One of the common um, fears that people have, of course, is that they're not going to have access to a charge. What, what, do, what do you say to that? Well, that's exactly why we're taking action. And the infrastructure law is so exciting because it allows us to deploy this network at no charge so that no one ever has to wonder if they're going out on a long road trip. They're going to make it to where they need to be without uh, being stuck. It's not a small debt, right? But we have billions of dollars to support. We've got to make sure every, every penny of that's well used, which is exactly what our joint office I think is going to be doing day in, day out. Billions and billions of dollars, seven and a half billion dollars for up to 500,000 charges, which is possible. Huge. You've got to put them in areas where we know we don't have that concentration of them exactly. already. In particular, if there's multi-family dwellings, folks who don't have the uh, Jay's apartment buildings, and then in rural uh, areas where there's long distances between stops potentially, and certainly on freeways. Tell me about your experience of driving this electric vehicle. It is uh, pretty zippy, actually. And I noticed that as we're driving, people are glancing. Longing at the yeah. <laughs> and it's not just because of you in the car, it's because the car is cool. I think for early adopters, electric vehicles were viewed as a luxury. Yeah. But well, we got to move to where it's, it's accessible, user friendly, affordable for everyone. Right. More affordable even than a gas powered vehicle. Right? Yes. We're so, happy. exactly. I mean, that's what the Build Back Better Act is all about is bringing down the price of the vehicle off the floor. You are at the dealer. So that it is comparable to a gas car vehicle. The, the car industry is ready to be able to make all of the vehicles that will be in demand. Tons of new capacity, new jobs, new facilities. This president is going to make sure that we as a country have decided that we want this industry in the United States and that we're not just going to stand idly by and allow other countries to scoop it away from us. We are going to make this stuff here. We're going to put it what policy matters, right? Yeah. You know, these in some way should be formed. We have no matter what. We don't need to make America. We don't have to put that up. We need to be available to everybody. Yeah. That's what we want. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So glad to be here with Secretary Buttigieg. So glad to have driven here with Secretary Buttigieg. And all was well. I can report that he's an excellent driver. We are going to work together to deploy electric vehicle charging across the country. Whether you live in a dense city, whether you live in a rural county, the electric vehicle revolution is for you. That electric vehicle charging is being enabled by the bipartisan infrastructure law, which has seven and a half billion dollars in it to ensure that every pocket of the nation has access to charging. We're really excited about what this means in terms of accelerating that uh, all important transition for our climate. And we're gonna to continue to work to make sure that it's accessible and affordable to all. So that was it. You have it from the 
fourth is not. So how do I get that? Hmm. It didn't, but now we have to just go back to the other. Are you falling asleep yet? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Okay, my power is still back there. Yeah, right. so this, it's a single slide. And the reason why it's a single slide is simply because it is still pending. They can't agree on anything right now in our Congress. So I hope they are spending many evenings working into the night trying to achieve some goals here. Um, so it's about extending the tax credit for solar, wind, and electric vehicles. You know, every car that you buy the electric car, the first 200,000 of uh, any model will attract uh, roughly $7,500 in the tax credit that can be applied towards the price of the car. And um, it also depends on the battery size within the car, of course. So it's in the Maybe four thousand or something like that. And um, provide energy assistance to consumer rebates. And there's billions of dollars to help clean energy startup companies, help homeowners weatherize their houses. Very important product, as you know. And uh, because it cuts down on your heating bills and the air conditioning bills, uh, both summer and winter, it's beneficial for you to have a good insulation at your home. Um, <clears throat> The well, reason why things in my eyes are quite miserable compared to Scandinavia is simply because the cost of energy has been too low for too long. They haven't paid for the for the cost, but the cost to be to cover for the enhanced building code, enhanced building standards. And that's something we're talking with the city of Chicago about right now, as a matter of fact, is that there's new multi-unit dwellings or multi-family dwellings that they are going to put up. Well, they have to be uh, energy efficient. And uh, we have a, a, what we call a field house in, in, uh, in Dimitri at the Concordia Language Village. And that was built by um, funding from the German government. And it demonstrates what a building code should look like in order to receive, or in order to achieve the net zero status, meaning that. You know that they uh, it sort of produces energy enough by itself to to balance the energy consumption. <laughs> That's zero. Okay. There we go. And it has to finance uh, for small businesses and invest in farm to small agriculture, something which is very important for North Dakota. I don't have the details yet because, as you know, the deal is still being negotiated, so we don't know really what's in it. But that will contain uh, smart agriculture and rural clean energy. And invest in workforce training, innovation, and equity. And those are all what that new build back there bill should be covering. So we sit here anxiously waiting for the bill to be. So where is North Dakota in this IJA program? And first of all, funds allocated from the bill over five years is $2.6 billion to North Dakota. That's a lot of money, right? That's really a lot of money. And uh, as you see, highways, $1.7 billion is allocated. Bridges, $225 million. Public transportation, $109 Water infrastructure. Therefore, EV expansion, $26 million. Of course, I want to get my time to hands on those $26 million, <laughs> but let's see. Broadband, $100 million, and resiliency, uh, you know, and the million. And it's going to be spread over a five year period to 12%, 15, 20, 24, and 28 percent year over year. This is just a rough number, okay? Every state has to submit their plan. And North Dakota has to submit its plan, and I don't know where they're going to end up on this percentage scale exactly. Because some things you may have to do earlier than others, which is causing a 
overspending uh, compared to the water planning. But we have to be flexible and uh, see what we can do. And I know the secretary who is Graham will be flexible with us too. So the agency, I was just informed about that today, as a matter of fact. Um, one of our senators that I have contact with, Dr. Hogan, she wrote the Department of the Budget um, and she got an answer and they say these are the four departments that will administer the program. So the DSC, the Environment Quality, Commerce, and the Infrastructure Technology Department. And so they will have to figure out uh, what to do with the money that are out there to the state. And that's where we come into the picture. We have to tell our leaders, what do we want? Okay. Okay. So DOC even made a little handbook for them to use in order to find out how to actually apply for these funds. And uh, that's useful. It's a toolkit that they can apply here by the state department and try to find out how to utilize the funds in the best and the most efficient manner. Uh, come back to the alternative fuel corridor. As you can see here, we don't really have them yet. There has to be, we, we have a, uh, it's a pending uh, corridor. I mean, uh, it's in for debate with the Federal Highway Authority whether or not we can call it a corridor yet, because there really aren't very many uh, charging stations. There's not very much uh, compressed natural gas uh, or hydrogen alternative fuel, and so that's why uh, this, uh, this industry, I-94 and 29, are not uh, darker for them. We want them to be darker than that. Yeah. Oh. So the other solution is, is siting success. How many charging points and power levels to meet the demand? Where to site them? When to provide which incentives for which site? And how to allocate funding for the use? And how to roll out programs successfully? So those are questions that have to be answered. Again, we have the opportunity to provide our input to the various departments as and when they ask for it. We hope they have soon. And the regional fast charging sites, the categories of sites are interurban and intra-urban. And then there's the private, residential, business, livery, and commercial streets. So these are the different site pair categories that are being defined in that infrastructure bill. And that is what we have to work towards is to identify where to put interurban charging stations. And those are the corridor stations and uh, what we have to do within the city for the various cities like Grand Falls and Fargo and this one. Right. So right now we have the fast charges where those things are from. And so you know they do exist out there. They're, they're, they are not within the 50 mile distance between each other but we're getting closer but I have calculated that we need to be about 20 of these more, 20 more, in order to uh, fulfill the objective for Highway I-29, uh, 94, Highway 2, and then the North-South Highway um, in between. So these are the targets, risks, and barriers for the regional DCFC is dial turn, fast stop. Okay, fast targets are uh, targets. So the targets are a mix of level two, which is the 208 to 240 volt charges, single base, and the uh, DC fast charging below 150 kilowatts. Most of the fast charges today, the ones you find in the Bismarck and Chicago or Grand Fork, they are 62.5 uh, kilowatts, or some of them are 50, 52 kilowatts. But there are barriers, of course, is misperception, funding, incentives, and rate certainties, and demand charges. That's a, a biggie. Electricity companies, when they charge for electricity, they also uh, <laughs> thank you, Ed, during the time is over. Uh, they also charge for demand charges. 
And that's usually what comes at a very big hefty item on your bill. And we've got to find ways to prevent it to do that. But it rewards them in some other way. I mean, it has to be a win win situation. So that's an Wisconsin is uh, taking an example of four charges, 150 kilowatts for each charge. That's how they're going to look like in the future. All right. I'm just going to skip this here because it's not much more for you. So this is the RFP bill, and then we're finished. Uh, for that. It's a statewide company that the electric vehicle plant in North Dakota Department of Transportation. It was sent out not so long ago. And uh, various engineering firms have now uh, submitted their bids. Three of them were selected to go into the second round. And out of those three, there will be one selected to do this, uh, this plan. And uh, based on a proposal sent out by um, uh, the joint office. So these goals are to create an executive committee of uh, diverse uh, multi disciplinary stakeholders. So who will be nominated for these groups? It must be diverse. There will be a creation of a public involvement. Again, I've said it many times. Development of executive summary. An education plan. And when it comes to uh, involvement, public involvement, I appeal to the younger generation to become involved. It's your future. I'm, a, I'm almost in there to become involved. Yeah, I'm always at the end of my life. So um, you need you guys really you need to step up and put your hand for to your legislature. And we'll talk about roadway use of trees and plans for the talking infrastructure and so forth. And um, the deliverable will be a plan for EVs and their fueling in the state of North Dakota. And it will give a recommendation for which areas will receive funding and how much. And develop a plan to integrate battery electric vehicles into the fleet of the state. Not just the charging stations, but also the fleet of the state. And for example, the garbage trucks in Congo and uh, they could run under natural gas, which is just not a problem. And uh, reduce the CO2 emissions from, from the combustion of diesel. And they have to ask questions of who shall own and operate the station, uh, pilot and public partnership uh, have to be created, and they have to submit by February the 10th. That's our key proposal, which they did. And the deadline for the report is in August 2022. So they don't have much time to put this together. Okay. And the last slide I want to talk about is the Native Americans have uh, been awarded $7.5 million to put electrical vehicle infrastructure in the ground between the Red Lake and the Standing Rock tribal area. So you're going to see this uh, being uh, uh, realized soon. The idea is we're going to try and get as many Native American contractors involved in building this infrastructure plan. Out so we will be a real ease out there. So get more involvement by the local community, create good jobs, good well paying jobs within the same family. And uh, again, as you can see, this is a program that is done by the North Dakota Green City uh, that is controlled by the American Long Association of St. Paul. And they plan to do education and outreach at 62 events over three years. So it's, uh, it's quite good. Okay. So that's it. I can go on and on. Okay, but I'm going to stop here and open up for questions. Any questions? Yes, please. Government will not build anything. They will just allocate funds for private, many private uh, businesses to come up with a proposal that fulfills the requirements of NDDMP. And they will say, Yeah, I'd like to apply for funding. And then it may be something like maybe 20, 80% from this kind of funding and 20% of their own. I'm just guessing now because I haven't seen the rules yet. Okay? 
but something like that. That's the idea. We want to have private equity involved here. And for the government funding it. Like, no, you don't have to pay for something, you don't need it. Yes, sir. Very good question. <laughs> Repeat the question. Yeah, the question where oh yeah. Yeah. for the what recording. Kind of energy, yeah, what yeah. kind of energy is being used to provide supply these resources? Well, right now it's a combination of late night power, which has the CO2 emissions. Uh, then it is uh, wind energy and some solar. And of course, the objective is to be wind and solar with a lot of battery storage. But until then, we have to find a solution to phase out the midnight uh, carbon uh, emissions. And the governor wants to do it with CO2 sequestration. You will hear from Sonia Kay, who's going to present here uh, the fourth presentation. She's going to discuss. Uh, about this that idea whether it's useful or not and uh, uh, we have a lot of questions about the food sequestration because we haven't seen really successful uh, concepts yet also you may not know but it takes about 25 percent more electricity power than uh, what you already have to take to sequester uh, the emissions from the lignite power plant yeah. Any other questions? Talk about the uh, the battery stock and the metals and then type of space that we want to fix a lot of the else out there where you want to allocate more battery resources and then you know just keep on that. Yeah, so the question was if uh, there was money allocated to research on how to dispose of uh, batteries in a clean and, and, and responsible manner. The back end, and yeah, I guess, yes, there is. That was in the, in the bill. I think it was, uh, I forgot exactly how, many, how much money it was, $8 billion, I guess. $8 billion was set aside for things like that. So, yeah. Yes, please. Oh, no, we never <laughs> dawned on me. China, 
They have their own market to supply, not in Europe, they have their own market to supply. We, we, we need to do that here. And to create new jobs is the important part of it. We can't go down the same old way of, of using oil and gas like we have. We can't get rid of it right away. I understand that. There has to be an easing in. As a matter of fact, I'm suggesting that some, some of the. Yeah. Excuse me. What are you going to make the part and the oil that goes into a wind turbine? Well, you see, uh, there is a course, and uh, there is a course. Uh, the question was, what are, you, what are you going to do about carbon that goes into making the wind turbine? Um, that's a finite, a finite amount of carbon that does happen when you make the steel, when you put the concrete foundation in. Uh, cement production alone produces almost 7% of all greenhouse gases. So it's true, it's there. I'm not disputing that at all. You're, you're right having those questions. But one thing is to have the question. Another thing is to come with an answer. And we need to look at what is the answer to mitigate the CO2 emissions. Because the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, the warmer it gets, the more you de decentralize the climate, and the worse we are on. And that is the problem. We have lost more than 50% of all species just since I was born. 50%. You know, when I was born, there were 2.3 billion people on this earth. Now there's 7.8, I think it is, or 7.6. It doesn't really matter. It's in the sediment. Five billion extra people just in my lifetime. By golly, we are so good in here, huh? <laughs> and, and that comes with a cost. And then when you change the climate balance at the same time, then you will find, for example, that the good old coffee beans can't be grown where it used to be grown anymore because now the climate has changed and the coffee beans will not be what you're used to. So we have to move it somewhere else, maybe, if that area exists. Or just forget about it. It's like Greenland. We've got ice up there on, on Greenland. Now it's just this day, as a matter of fact. It's melting with double the speed of what we had estimated just a few years back. So things are accelerating out of control. That's the problem. I'm not saying you have to switch from tomorrow to renewable energy right away. You can't do that. You need a lot of things to make it happen. But you may ask yourself, and I'm asking that question just hypothetically here. When you look at the situation we have in the world right now, for example, Ukraine and Russia and their their death force, which is an economic death force to get control over natural resources. Well, you know, the Russians and the Saudis, they control, they control quite a lot of oil and gas. They actually, that's their power, right? Do you want to empower them? Well, as you see, it's almost unpatriotic. It's unpatriotic to continue down the road of carbon-based fuel. It is unpatriotic. You can't go on and let them control the output or the uh, the uh, silence. You have to get away from it because the only reason why we have warfare are financial. That you know, when we had a problem in Darfur in in uh, the Congo and Sudan, nobody came to the rescue. Why? Because there was no help. There was nothing of value to us. So we said to help these people. We don't care if they die by the hundreds of thousands. Because there's nothing for us to help. But the moment you have a, 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 a source like oil or gas involved, then all of a sudden we can get our act together. For some reason we can do that. Because it's only based on the monetary incentive. And that's the problem I have with oil and gas industry. I, I, I acknowledge the good things that they provide. Heck, I lived 10 years in Saudi Arabia for using oil. Well, that wasn't exactly what I did, but the electrical infrastructure for that. But I benefited from it. You and I have benefited from it, for sure. But there has to be an end to this because our young generation sitting here, they're the ones coming in heavy. It's not responsible of you and me to go on down this line. And by the way, when it comes to the wind turbines, it's just a matter of weather. That means, that I know because I was in the wind business for a long time. And I can tell you, it's just a matter of cost. It's a cost benefit scenario. People look at it and say, all right, um, yeah, I can I can accept that it goes down. When these turbines were built, 
We didn't have this discussion to the same degree. The day something hits the fan, and now we're going to get out of the problem, and we can't do it unless we take a serious look at the emissions from water gas. So I know. <laughs> but thank you so much for the question because it gave me an opportunity to tell you what I really feel about it. Go ahead. Yes. I, I, I appreciate your thoughts on that question. I, I don't have the same kind of questions, right? Okay. Um, but to shift gears just, just a touch, uh, I, you were showing a, a, a map of the proposed connection corridors and where these EU charging stations would go and things yeah. like that. I noticed South Dakota doesn't have any, and that would be a real problem if people are moving, you know, to another continent. So why is that? Is Good that observation, yeah. So South, if you are asking, uh, are you saying South Dakota doesn't have any of these charging? Does it mean that when you drive south to the uh, to uh, Rapid City or so, you're going to get stranded, right? That's what I wonder about. Yeah, but South Dakota has an equivalent bill like we do. Okay. All right. And so they're going to also allocate, I think it's $28 million, as a matter of fact, for EV charging. So they're going to get it as well. But somebody, it has to start somewhere, right? And so I think it's I, what is it, I 90, I think that goes through them. Yes, I 90. I 90, right? Yes. So you're going to see a uh, compensation coming up there. But they don't have an overnight because there are problems related to, you know, maybe not to manufacture the charging stations, but one area I can re recommend you young kids to go into is uh, uh, the adjournment. You know, we lack adjournment immensely. To put on these EV chargers in the ground and connect them to the high voltage grid and so on. There's a future job for sure to do this. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, my question is related to the uh, vehicle automobile makers and the truck makers right now. Uh, how much is being allocated out in terms of their production for? electric vehicles compared to how are they making a transition are they doing it now is there any action there is it only tesla what is it yeah no there are lots of other manufacturers out there that are, that are manufacturing cars i think we're expecting roughly 80 new models just in the coming year and uh, most uh, car manufacturers you know are expanding with a new line of evs and uh some of them have even said that we're not going to have any more combustion engine vehicles by year so and so much. And then I just announced that 2030, we will not be allowed to sell in, in the term combustion engine any longer. They can't sell any new cars with high you know, internal combustion engines. That's an example of uh, for Canada. And it's happening in Europe as well. And as I said, you know, we don't have any high density of population compared to other places. If you try to put yourself in their place and the pollution associated with it, then you know you've got to make a change. But because you don't feel it, it's very hard for you to comprehend it. It's part of it. How intense the pollution is in the rest of the world. It really, I mean, I'm so happy I live here. I can tell you that. It's a wonderful place. I can deal with the cold. Not a problem. The next just letters and I'm happy. You guys have no idea what it is to live in, in, in these other countries are highly populated, dense populated, and uh, uh, doing lots of pollution. I'm saying they are really poor. Because they just jack up the output on the engine by getting more people into the engine, and out comes big building skies of black smoke. And because they need more engine power, you can do that, there's no control with them. The, the, the uh, city environment is not taking water. Just one example. We are such a city. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, the EPA is asking that we need to cut our energy consumption down and create a But at the same time, I'm thinking we're worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, 
question. Thank you for asking that. The question is, you know, uh, what's the rest of the world going to do? Uh, is it just us who are going to cut the Or what about China? What about India? What about all the other countries? And yeah, that has been discussed. Uh, I just need you to know that of all the CO2 emissions on this globe, 25% of it comes from us. And we are 4% of the world population. 4%. And we produce 25% of all the new deaths. Try to adapt to, you know, solve that number. 4% producing 25% of all the new deaths. And that's because we are actually not being very economical in the way we're using the then you can go back in history and say, well, when did it start? The uh, Industrial Revolution, 1860s, and, and England, and coal, and uh, Western Europe, and America burning fossil fuels all the time. If you compare that with the CO2 output of all these other countries during the same time frame, you will see that they have produced next, next to nothing compared to what our footprint has been. So we need to show the way forward. We need to know the technology and sell them and provide them to these other countries. And we have a responsibility towards the poorer countries of the world. We do, because we have, on the back of, of them, uh, their ancestors, we have been building our common-based economy. They have not. So we have a debt to pay back. So that's why. And so we need to, even though China is emitting more, and it's true, it's probably going to be the most competitive uh, trade partner or, or, or enemy in the world, they are acutely aware of it as well. And they have to change their generation portfolio from coal and oil base to something else. And they're busy doing it. Because when you buy solar panels today, where do they come from? China. They come from China. They have all these electronics you put in their in the cars come from China or it's from Taiwan. Taiwan is okay with all things, but but they come from overseas. So you know we need to pull that technology back to ourselves and we need to know good here at home, create good jobs, create good jobs. But that doesn't mean we can't put pressure on China. Of course we can. But as long as we are depending on oil and gas, we don't have much to argue. We really don't. We don't have the upper hand. You've got to have the upper hand. The other hand is to make yourself independent of oil and gas. And then you can put the thumb on these guys. Because you can't do it now. When you're, same, you're in the same boat right now, you're actually beholden to the world market prices. And there is a the problem. You, you don't control it. We don't control it. It's the world market price. And who, control, who controls the world market price? Yeah. yeah, well, then it makes a nuclear plant. Yeah. The question was who's going to make it? And I would say, yeah, let's make some small nuclear power plants, let's make some more solar plants, let's put some batteries in the ground. You know, by a 100 miles, 100 miles solar array, you can provide all the energy the United States needs. Complete continuously. That, that is a, that is a fact. You can calculate yourself to that result. But I'm not saying you have to do that. But if you put enough batteries and store the energy to use it when you don't have sunlight or to use it when you don't have wind, then you can even out the power curve. And that's what we are doing with gas turbines today. The reason why gas turbines are sold as they are, and a lot of them, replacing and phasing out coal, is because they take care of the peak during the day. When the, you know when you start in the morning, you get a hot shower, you go for a cup of coffee, whatever, and you turn on for the stove, the electric stove you may have, when you turn on the air conditioner the, at noon. Well, that's when the gas turbine kicks in. But it comes with a drawback. The drawback is the CO2 emissions. Because that's what's going to kill us in the future. So we've got to make a change. We've got to start somewhere. You can't stand still and not do anything. By not doing anything, you're like a frog in a boiling pot of water. 
You will stay there until you die. And you've got to change your outlook and look at what's the overall effect going to be for these young people sitting here. Not you. We're nearly there. Yeah. Well, I'm supposed to. Anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, think practically for how many more years do we have? How many more years do these people have? The young people sitting down here. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, turn your head a little bit further to the right. <laughs> yes, sir. Question. Yeah, the question was if uh, which energy source, solar, wind, is best in a cold environment. And I would say solar panels will not be a better in a cold environment. Uh, when you keep them cool, the, the efficiency of the panel increases. And so you get more output out of a cool panel than you do up in the hot summer day. You see a, a reduction in output. But wind blows, you know, wind turbines current where the wind blows. And, and so you may have an oversupply, which happens from time to time when we have too much energy. When you listen to the to the coal companies nowadays, they cry because they can't compete with them. You sell wind for 2.5 cents a kilowatt hour, and you produce coal for 3.6, 3.8. And why is that? Well, you know, it's economic. You know, the less you produce from a fixed size power plant, the more the cost per kilowatt hour is. Right? So when you replace that energy with something sustainable, then of course they're going to cry. It's quite clearly they're going to cost. And then they're going to call all kinds of crap about solar and wind. They're going, oh, they're killing all this and all those jobs and so on. But no, this is just, you know, that's capitalism in a nutshell. Nutshell. That's what it is. That's what we live in. It's a capitalist country, supply and demand rules. And you can make it cheaper than somebody else, but then you die if you don't make it cheaper. Now, I don't want taxpayer dollars. I would, I would prefer not to have too much taxpayer dollars involved, but there is a situation where you know you've got to balance it with the good of the good of the country where it's the good of the individual. We want the individual to be proper. But when you have to have a paradigm shift like this, then you have to have some government involved. We do the same thing with military. If we don't put money in our big military, you taxpayers, you don't do that. What strength do we have in the world? We don't have any. So you're willing to pay for the military, but you're not willing to make yourself independent from oil and gas. I mean, really, why should I be beholden to oligarchs in Russia who control oil and gas or sheikhs in Saudi Arabia? Who decide what the price of oil is going to be here? Because that's what they do. We only produce 8 million barrels a day here, and we use 20 million barrels a day in the United States. So those 12 million barrels have to come from somewhere, and they decide the price, not you. We were energy independent before this. When? Yeah. When, was, when did that last, happen? Huh? Last before this administration. No, you were not. Yeah, we were. Why do you think I'm in money in Saudi Arabia? I don't know where you've been, but it's no, well, very western North Dakota for the last few years. You can see what was going on out there. Yeah. You made money in Western North Dakota, but the country of the United States did not make money to that degree that you did. That's the problem. You have to face the reality is that you cannot ex you cannot give an example of your local situation that applies to the rest of the world or the rest of the United States. You're selling green energy. No, I'm not. I'm not selling green yeah, energy. You're the president of your company. What? You're the president, right? Your company. Yeah, I sell chargers. Yeah. I'm not selling green energy. What is that green? No, they're just a product by which you can deliver it. Yeah. I'm totally dependent on what the energy companies do. That's what I cannot choose. Oh, I want to put wind energy in here, or solar there, or or hydrogen, uh, or whatever it is. I can't choose that. It's not my job. It's the job of the state to decide what you're going to do 
for the loss and for the future, which is, is to make this as sustainable as possible. So we can continue living in harmony on this world. Because what's going to end up is what you see in Ukraine and Russia, what you saw in Libya, what you see in Syria. You know, all fighting for the same thing, access to oil and gas because of where they can get that money. But when you make that more irrelevant, when you make it irrelevant, that's when you have the upper hand. You've got to see the, the, the upper hand from the United States. We've got brain power. We have universities like these. Do you think I can find that in Kampala and Uganda? No, I cannot. I don't have an educated map like I have here. So let's use this educated group of young people to make our competitive position stronger globally. That's what it's about. Thank you. <laughs> let's give them a round of applause.